Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our exclusive Global Leading Voices webinar campaign. We are delighted to have you join us here today. Please be informed that if you have any questions during the presentation, you may type them into the question box in your control panel. The presenter will answer your questions at the end of the presentation accordingly. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenter, who will begin shortly. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this uh, New Year's uh, session for PCB. Um, we were invited actually to um, give you some insights on uh, on ethical hacking and cybersecurity and uh, what's uh, going to be expected for 2022. Um, together with me, Aaron Gernat is joining in the session. Um, you will take care of the, uh, the technical part of the session. So Aaron, uh, let's go for the agenda for today and see what we're going to talk about. Um, just to give, um, to have an idea what we uh, could expect for 2022, it might be um, rather interesting also to have a rewatch or actually have a sort of resume on what we have seen in 2021 because uh, we'll probably learn a few things from it. And uh, then we will look into the cyber agenda and the probable uh, issues we might face for the next years. It will be, of course, quite, quite a challenge. And um, then we will dive a bit more technical in, in, into a few items. Um, Erwin will talk about ransomware, what's the next generation of ransomware. And of course, part of that story will, uh, of course, be geopolitics. Next, um, one of the topics that will evolve, of course, in the near future is IoT, so uh, Internet of Things, and even the industrial versions of that one. And except for the technical part, we will also talk about um, some uh, legislation and some out-of-band things that actually are not only technical, but uh, it's quite important to know what, what will evolve. And last but not least, um, if you know uh, what to expect, um, we will give you some quick hints also what you can do, what are the measures that you can take as a company, as a responsible for security uh, to do so. And uh, we will take care of a few questions and answers. Just be aware that at the end of the session, we uh, probably have 10 minutes, 15 minutes actually to answer questions. Um, depending on the volume of the questions we will get, that might not be sufficient. So um, first of all, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the uh, in the message box in chat box. We will guarantee that you will get an answer to the uh, to the questions even offline. So what we will do after the session is collect the questions and uh, publish the answer to that one on the LinkedIn page, which we will uh, refer uh, during the session. So um, keep posting. If you have any questions, you will uh, uh, surely get an answer on that one. So right. Good. We can uh, start off with the with the session, Aaron. Yes. Next slide. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. So, <clears throat> like Peter said, it's uh, all about 2022, but uh, uh, we need to learn from history. So, if we think about what we have seen in 2021, uh, besides the the COVID pandemic, uh, it was from a cybersecurity point of view a very hectic year. I mean, uh, I have been active in cybersecurity for more than 20 years now, and I thought that I have seen all, but if you look at uh, the incidents of an unprecedented impact that they had on a lot of uh, organizations worldwide, uh, not only in a specific industry or in a specific country, and let's talk about the solar winds and the, the exchange attacks, but also, the supply chain attack, uh, like what happened with uh, Kazea, but also at the end of the year, the Log4j uh, exploit that was found in an open source component that had an impact on almost any organization and any software stack that was using this open source component. Uh, it's just the tip of the iceberg, I think, on what will happen in 2022. And also, the list of victims of ransomware attacks with a huge impact because these companies either had to pay to be able to recover the data or uh, went offline for several weeks and had to make a public announcement of a data breach, a loss of confidential information, customer data, and all that. So, and of course, uh, ransomware, the, the different groups, the, the, the criminal gangs that are responsible, 
have also been uh, tied with, for example, uh, governments that use the ransomware gangs to, to really do the, this kind of attack. For example, the Revil ransomware group that was arrested uh, last week, uh, but they were responsible for everything that was related to, to the Kazea ransomware attacks that had an impact worldwide. So let's talk about these black swans, which are unpredictable attacks, but with a high impact globally. And that's very important. Uh, if you look at the, the SolarWinds attack, for example, uh, these attackers had foot on the ground for six months. They were able to inject a never seen Trojan horse custom built for that uh, SolarWinds uh, Orion software component. And when they were able to test the Trojan horse for effectiveness, they stayed out of the code repository to make sure that they were not being detected. And then due to the automatic update of this Trojan horse, every customer worldwide, including big enterprises like Microsoft, Cisco, uh, Coca-Cola, they were all impacted with this Trojan horse. And it was until a security company detected something uh, malicious on their network that we were able to see that this was a new type of supply chain attack. So that was already uh, shocking uh, the ground uh, everywhere. And uh, the biggest problem here was that a lot of companies did not even know that they had that kind of software running in their internal network. So asset discovery, uh, software inventory, everything that is uh, quite uh, critical to control uh, and also for, for ISO, uh, a lot of companies struggled to really find out that they were uh, breached uh, because of this solar wide throwing horse. And then a few months later, the, the big problem with Microsoft Exchange on premise. And so uh, this was really a devastating attack uh, originating from uh, China, uh, it's to be believed. They were abusing a zero day vulnerability using a dot dot slash and using a remote code execution attack to inject javascript web shells in the web server that was used uh, by microsoft exchange for the outlook web access and active sync and by exploiting a, a just a stupid web vulnerability uh, these criminals were able to hijack the exchange server and use that in their uh, lateral movements to attack the internal network because as by design the microsoft exchange needed connection to the outside world to allow active sync and it needed connection to the internal domain controller to be able to authenticate the users of microsoft exchange so a lot of, of companies were hit because these attacks could be fully automated and there were several criminal gangs copycatting each other and abusing the, the flaw to gain access in uh, a short amount of time. And also what is very important that uh, this kind of, of attack uh, could be stopped by using web application firewalling because the problem also here was that uh, the patch required to solve the vulnerability uh, was not installed immediately by, by most organizations. So uh, I know of specific situations that customers wanted to patch the exchange and at the moment they log in on the server, they got pop-ups by antivirus software saying, hey, uh, we found these kind of JavaScript web shells already on your environment. And then you have, of course, the typical questions like, okay, we have been attacked. There is a throwing horse on our machine. What did they do? And a lot of companies don't have the answer to that because they don't have visibility in firewall logging. They don't have uh, log consolidation or, or security incident event monitoring in place. And especially nobody really looking at that kind of uh, attacks. So very hard to say what happened there. And then of course, in December, 
I still remember it was a Friday, and then I saw uh, Project Discovery updating uh, nuclei templates to scan for lock for shell LDAP injection. I was like, what what can be the problem here? Because LDAP injection is something for internal. And then suddenly you start uh, to, to dig in and then Twitter exploded uh, because security researchers were like, whoa, uh, there are so many software tools impacted with this vulnerability, but also so many security solutions like firewalls, like uh, wireless access points, everything was impacted with this vulnerability. And uh, I think a lot of big bounty hunters earned a lot of money because they found so many zero day vulnerabilities in, in big bounty programs, uh, which is of course the, the side effect of these uh, kind of zero days. And also a big problem with Log4j was that the uh, patching was not that straightforward because the, the patch did not fix the vulnerability and introduce a new vulnerability. So the system administrators really had their hands full of work to fix this. So what can we expect in this year? And uh, well, it's almost uh, some 11 months ago because the next week it's already February. But uh, I think, and, and uh, also a lot of our uh, peers think that there will be an increase again in ransomware attacks. So we all know that um, and we are becoming at the next level, uh, like we have next generation antivirus, we will have next, genera next generation ransomware. Uh, because people pay. So organizations that have a breach and that they pay the ransom, they keep the ecosystem of those criminals alive. And there's a lot of money going around because with the virtual currencies, with payments and Bitcoin, uh, it's very easy for them to stay anonymous. Although there are assumptions that it is possible and it will be possible to trace the usage of Bitcoins used in ransomware attacks. So the hope is that there will be enough activity on tracing Bitcoin that it might be possible to see who is responsible for this ransomware attack and how can we recover the money, but also how can we arrest the criminals? Uh, so that's very important. So we have seen there are four levels of uh, ransomware. Uh, in fact, level zero is what I called the, the old school ransomware. People get a, a virus and it's automated spreading and infecting everything it sees. Well, we all now know that these kind of attacks are not really happening again. The ransomware of the latest century, no, yes, the latest decade, in fact, is human operated hacking. So the last ransomware attacks that I have seen, uh, these criminals are not using anything related to viruses. They are using stolen credentials, either via phishing or uh, by buying something on the, the dark web, or using VPN credentials, or exploiting vulnerabilities in internet-facing systems. So for example, if you look at the latest list of the US agency CISA, they publish a list now every month with the top exploitable and attack uh services and you see a lot of vpn software firewall software but also uh, company software that used to be used internally but with everybody working from home and they opened the firewall to give access to Atlassian confluence or give access to zoho or whatever uh software we have running and so the latest ransomware attacks will be a combination of exploiting vulnerabilities in software like firewalls, VPN gateways, extranet software, internet software, and use that to pivot into the internal network, all human operated hacking. So uh, really uh, people attacking uh, from so, uh, somewhere in the world, these networks to identify what data can we steal, 
what services are in, important for that customer and how can we gain as much money as possible without um, getting detected. So these criminals, they will not use a well-known malware to break in, but they will use typical IT tools or they will deploy uh, something that is not detected as a malicious because malicious activity means uh, you download a Trojan horse, you start encrypting data, but now these criminals, they are being like a rogue IT administrator that is just able to hack into your uh, VMware and delete all your VMware images or replace your existing VMwares with encrypted VMware using either the functionality of VMware to, to encrypt backup or whatever you have. So they're abusing their access by gaining full admin access to your internal data. And they want to monetize as much as possible uh, what you have. So instead of encrypting everything, they will do a limited encryption just to prove that they can do that. And they will have persistent footholds in your network. And then the next step would be, okay, if you don't pay, well, they will destruct everything you have, including backups, including uh, cloud data even. So I, I think that the next wave of ransomware attacks will be attacking hybrid environments and also impacting your cloud. So because a lot of, of organizations say, okay, and we have an on-premise backup, but we want to make sure that we have offsite backup. So we have an offsite backup in, for example, Azure or Amazon Web Services, but because there is a single sign-on between the corporate network and the cloud, these attackers can pivot from the internal network to the cloud environment as well and start deleting or uh, moving or copying data there as well. And that uh, will become a very difficult uh, process to, to handle if it's really that disruptive. And how do these gangs work? Well, they are not all uh, ransomware uh, writers. So there's a ransom as a service platforms. They gain in popularity. They are not expensive and they are used to, to really target uh, organizations. And I have said this before, but with cloud and with the advances in artificial intelligence and machine learning, these uh, attackers, these threat actors have also their own data warehouse. And they will know that, for example, that there is tomorrow a new vulnerability for Microsoft Exchange on premise. They can immediately cre create a query to see, okay, which organizations are running that version that is impacted and they can start attacking it like with one push of a button. So they will stay, of course, very opportunistic. Yeah? They will attack whatever they can attack if they have that, the knowledge. Uh, but they will combine the encryption of the data locally with exfiltration of data, uh, trying to hop uh, from your local network to your cloud environment uh, or use your network connection to attack, for example, uh, your customers or, or use your uh, VPN that you have with a business partner to pivot into that uh, partner environment. That was one of the, the, the specific attacks that we have seen in the last years is that many service providers that are responsible for handling the IT of a lot of companies that, well, the attackers have much more success of breaking into more organizations when they were able to attack the service providers, the, the supply chain of those organizations. And I think that will become a very, uh, destructive uh, activity for them and that a lot of IT companies that deliver these kind of services and for example, what happened with Kaseya 
And the CADEA was used by those MSPs to manage the IT of the customer. And now it was abused to encrypt every machine that had CADEA running on, on, on that endpoint. So, and CADEA is not the only one that will have these kind of problems. Uh, imagine that uh, tomorrow there is a vulnerability in Microsoft Intune and the attacker is able to execute a PowerShell script that configures BitLocker with an unknown key and when you reboot your machine it is uh, broken well uh, it can be very uh, devastating for all those customers using Microsoft 365 so we have to be aware of that and then of course now with uh, the problem in Ukraine and that there was already this kind of uh, attack a few years ago to to have this kind of electricity uh, blackout uh, when the Krim was annexated. Um, ransomware will not be abused to to get the money, but the ransomware can be uh, used as a kind of uh, camouflage to say, hey, this is a ransomware uh, attack, but in fact, it is just a, a, a way of disguise to really cause a, a lot of problems. And when you know that you are able to hack into ministries or a uh, supply chain or critical infrastructure like a telco or electricity or the nuclear plant in uh, Kiev, well, if you can do that, then it's a very dangerous situation because it, you, it can also cause a lot of collateral damage because when, for example, the nuclear plant in Ukraine goes down because of a cyber attack, it can have an impact on the electricity supply of other countries in uh, Europe as well. So you never know up front. And then uh, two weeks ago, in that attack, uh, it is apparently the, the, the Russian uh, cybersecurity uh, army that created a new kind of malware called Whispergate. And Whispergate is a destructive malware disguised as ransomware, but when it was executed on a Windows machine, it just deleted the master boot record. And what is the master boot record? So when you start up your uh, computer, the master boot record will instruct the operating system what to boot, so what to start. But when the master boot record is dead because it's corrupted, uh, it cannot start a machine and you have lost all your data because it would also uh, do like in a stage two and three attack where it would corrupt all the files that you have. So this was linked to a Notpetya, and Notpetya was the malware used uh, a few years ago before the annexation of the Krim. And next to this destructive malware, uh, there was also an attack by another Russian gang against the content management system used by a lot of um, ministries in Ukraine. And what did they do? They did web defacement. And web defacement is uh, something from the 90s, uh, old school where you just uh, put a political message on the, the home page of the website that you're able to breach. But here uh, there was a kind of uh, scary message to Ukrainian citizens that uh, the worst thing would happen and is yet to come. So it's like a, a kind of way of bringing a political message by breaking into this content management system. And it was a zero day vulnerability. Uh, so if you had a, again, if you didn't patch, you were vulnerable and you could be attacked. So uh, how to protect against all these kind of, of problems, uh, of course. Uh, well, um, we have to stop thinking that we cannot be attacked. Everybody that has internet capabilities either on-premise or in the cloud can be hacked. We need to have much better visibility in what's going on. We need to be able to protect these critical assets by different layers of defense. We need to stop using static passwords. Um, 
It's really important to have multi-factor authentication enabled for every online service you use, uh, not only for your enterprise account, but also for your personal accounts, because these attackers can also target your personal mailbox if that's a possible entry point to gain access to your enterprise account. You need to think about identification and authentication best practices, like uh, get an alert when somebody tries to log in uh, more than five times or uh, disable accounts that are not being used. Watch your egress traffic. What is egress traffic? It is the traffic from within your organization to the internet. Most firewalls are configured to allow from internal networks any protocol to the outside world. And this is where a lot of problems arise because this allows to have communication to botnets, to uh, download malware, to download a Trojan horse, to give remote uh, capabilities to these uh, threat actors to have a persistent foothold and so on. And of course, we need to protect lateral movement. How you can do that? Well, very important, zero trust networks. Don't trust anything. Don't think that you still have a parameter that is visible and is helping you to protect against the latest attacks. Like Microsoft would say, assume breach. Assume that there is a malicious actor on your network and you want to isolate that. How are you going to do that? Next thing in um, the topics we have uh, listed also on the presentation of the day is, is a less in the infrastructure part or less in the office part of your networks. Uh, so uh, Aaron uh, focused in, in the latest slides rather on the, in, in, in the enterprise systems, but um, there's some few more items that you should be aware of, which is uh, also um, very much increasing in use and, and first of all the IoT or Internet of Things approach. Um, we see an increase in use of devices that are internet connected, not only from a enterprise level, but certainly also on, on a personal level. And I'm talking about the use of smartwatches, home devices, kids' toys with internet connection uh, with some, some basic artificial intelligence. But also um, extremely important, um, not on the office network, but rather on the industrial part of the network uh, uh, that companies are using is uh, the connection of industrial devices. Um, connected to internet. Um, as Aaron already explained uh, in the attacks and the most famous one for example is in the pipeline company in the US. Uh, we had some waterworks companies who got, who got attacked actually closing down pipelines, opening up uh, devices and so on. So, so be aware that many of these systems control our daily lives. Um, providing electricity, providing water, um, providing internet a sense is, is, is extremely important. Also keep in mind um, that during COVID times we had some cases where actually um, hospitals were attacked and there's at least one case for example in Germany where it's known that actually by shutting down um, critical support devices um, we know that at least one patient died actually uh, due, due to the failure of the, of the devices. So um, what, what's the impact you can imagine that actually these kind of devices are uh, extremely important to, to safeguard people, so we are very, getting very close uh, to safety issues in that sense, and um, please be aware that actually there, there's, there's a huge uh, importance also for, for uh, crime or actually in healthcare department, so, so we can move to the next slide, Erwin. Um, one critical thing that you should be aware of is that we have seen an increase also in attacks in hospitals or even in a global scale. Um, not only hospitals but healthcare facilities, healthcare uh, in, in, the, in the broadest sense actually and of course we had an immense pressure by the corona and the COVID situation where people needed even more support for healthcare but um, please be aware that also uh, in crime where criminals do not have these ethical limits so they don't hesitate to attack even healthcare facilities and even in the last few weeks we had some news that the Red Cross organization was attacked. So please be aware there's a, there's a critical imbalance between ethical defenders versus crime. And um, so, so even as a defender you need to, to respect some, some 
uh, rules, there are some ethical guidelines, there even are some legislation, so you cannot simply counter-attack uh, a, a, a criminal, you can simply bust their devices, you can't even find them without using illegal uh, activities, so, so there's an important imbalance between defending and attacking in that sense, right? Please be aware that in essence, as Erwin already explained, Ransomware is a money business, so, so they, they throw the ethical guidelines overboard is if they can make money, they will attack. And um, furthermore, they don't have any uh, issues with, with uh, crossing borders uh, from an ethical perspective. So if they can make money out of it, they, they will attack. Um, is it a large company? Is it a small company? It doesn't matter, actually. If there's a chance that with easy money, um, they will get in, they will actually try to, um, to, to get in. Um, this is for the insurance, that's the next slide. Um, an extremely important evolution that we will see right now is that uh, in the past, in the, in the last years, um, there was a huge demand for insurance, so getting your money back when you get attacked, but um, until now the, uh, the, the insurance companies um, were actually soliciting for uh, more customers and the principle in that sense you should know is very important like car insurance, like uh, health insurance. Um, there's one major principle in insurance you need to have a, a certain volume of people paying their fees and based on that fees they will have a budget and based on that budget they can pay your, your damage. What's the main issue with ransomware insurance or cybersecurity ins insurance is that actually most of the well-known principles of insurance do not apply to cybersecurity insurance. And um, for the main reason is that one, one of the, the things in, in, in normal insurance is that, for example, in a car accident, um, if one of the parties makes an error, uh, makes some damage, the insurance will actually reclaim the, the expenses of that uh, of that issue of that damage in the counterpart. But the, these counterparts, so the, the one who has committed the crime, is usually in cybercrime not available, or at least sitting on the wrong side of the border, um, with a small exception, as we have seen with. Um, uh, with, with the cybercrime uh, busted by the, by the FSB, but, but even the, the, in most of the cases, the insurance company cannot reclaim uh, their expenses. Um, second thing is that um, liability um, is, is not really included in the current uh, cybersecurity insurance, so meaning that um, if you do not protect your company well enough, um, it's extremely difficult for the insurance company actually to prove that you were actually uh, uh, neg uh, neg uh, committing negligence, meaning that not implementing the proper security procedures. And of course, due to the high volume of claims, the high volume of costs, and you remember that if, if your company gets hacked, it will cost millions actually to recover, to um, revert the ransomware, to repair your devices, um, reputation damage, so the costs go up extremely easily, extremely fast. For that simple reason, actually, um, companies start thinking about, insurance companies start thinking about what is the, the, the benefit actually for offering these, uh, these insurances. And what you will see more and more now is that companies, insurance companies, will start putting in some additional claims to, um, to the insurance policies. And um, you can go to the next slide, so uh, Aaron. Um, what will happen actually is that um, they, they are, uh, getting away from the business, they're, they're putting in some additional conditions and it's very likely that um, if there is any sign of negligence, not uh, implementing proper protection measures in your company, um, then the companies will very likely actually uh, retract or will not pay the fees anymore. So um, they are thinking again, and many companies are even stopping to sell the, the ransomware um, and protection measures. So please be aware that the getting into uh, cybersecurity uh, ransom protection measures will cost more and more uh, because the, the business model is not there. So um, 
another, another question and also also explained by, by Erwin already before. One major issue uh, with ransomware, of course, is that if you keep paying, um, of course, the, the, the benefit of, of the, the ransom game will still be there. On the other hand, and what's, what you need to balance is please, please be aware if you don't pay and in most of the cases you don't have a backup and restore or a valid restore, the company is killed. So you kill the company, you kill the business, and you can't restart. So, so there, there's an impossible balance between paying the ransom and not paying the, the ransom. As what I have posted before, and in many of these uh, discussions, you will notice actually that not paying is only uh, an option if you have a valid backup and restore. We will come back at the end of the session into some additional explanations and uh, some additional um, hints and tips uh, as, as, uh, as what Aaron already explained. Another part, except for healthcare and uh, insurance, um, there's also a very important part on the level of legislations, um, not only on the EU part, so the European part, but also in globally, uh, we see uh, many things moving around actually to force companies to, to have at least a minimum of protection against these uh, uh, these evidences and the events we have been talking about before in, in this uh, meeting uh, today. Um, one of the things, uh, at least from the European part, uh, have, have an eye on the NIS directive. So um, the NIS directive, so it's not the NIST one, by the way, the NIST with an NIST is, uh, is the framework and security framework that you will have on the American side. But the NIS directive actually is a guideline, a directive that forces companies uh, with critical infrastructure and public infrastructure at, to uh, implement at least a minimum level of cyber security to protect actually the general public uh, for, for uh, still getting guaranteeing access to, to, to the business. Um, just for your information, very new, um, right now uh, the NIS directive has been published, implemented in most of the European countries uh, by, by law and, and by in, in practice. Um, now, nowadays, we're talking about NIS 2, so uh, there's a new version coming up. Um, still in, 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 in the beta uh, version, so there is a little, still a, little, a lot of draws, but one, one of the directions that we will go into is that even uh, not only uh, commercial companies, but also governmental organizations will be included in the NIS directive because in the first phase, um, the governmental uh, departments were not essentially included in the directive itself. Um, on top of that one, um, you will also see um, some actions in the Cyber Act, which has been voted and active right now. Um, the Cyber Act is mainly responsible for having a certification framework for um, certifying products, mainly products and services, uh, uh, to be um, cyber secure in, in a certain level. So the Cyber Act provides in three levels of, uh, of security. Um, you can, of course, uh, include um, the certification in people, meaning supporting these services as, as a requirement actually to implement. What will happen um, is pretty much the same what, uh, for example, the CMMC, um, the Cybersecurity Maturity Framework in the US is doing, is if you want to deliver services to, uh, to, to governments or organizations, you will have to prove at least that your product and your offering is uh, guaranteeing a minimum level of security in, in that sense. Um, what we are not focusing on today, of course, uh, is GDPR and data protection and privacy. It is extremely a direct link between data protection and cybersecurity. Of course, you will not have data protection, you will not have privacy if you don't have cybersecurity. Um, so you will see there is an impact also on the GDPR implementation, data protection implementation. So it's extremely important that also on that level, um, the push for more privacy, push for more security is helping us actually to, to implement better uh, cybersecurity. From the level of frameworks and best practice, so that's not legislation, but rather ISO implementation, you will see globally and uh, um, that there's, there's a huge push into uh, new standards. Um, so uh, certainly on level of cybersecurity, you will see the ISO 27100 series in development. There are a few new publications on that one. Because of these updates, you will also see in the legacy uh, ISO systems for information security meaning uh, ISO 2702 and ISO 27001, 
you see some updates. So uh, right now, uh, within a few days, um, the ISO 2702 will be officially published. And you will notice actually in the new standard, there are some explicit reference actually to some new cloud security, um, cybersecurity uh, requirements in, in that sense. But also keep in mind, uh, not only on the global level, European level, but also on American level and more specifically into the NIST and the, the sys controls framework there is an update coming up so they're matching up of course with the new standards as as fast as possible as soon as possible to keep up with the, uh, the current practice standards so um, you notice here there's a lot of new things coming up uh, lots of new ideas also for additional webinars so, so you will see that you you, you will keep uh, we will be kept busy actually for the next year right you can go for the next slide Aaron. So um, good. Um, go go for it. I think the next part is again for you, Erwin. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Peter. So um, I think what is really important for uh, if you think about okay, what would be the top priorities for this year is that uh, you need to be aware about what's going on. So. Uh, follow up some security uh, companies and, and security researchers on Twitter. Uh, assume the worst scenario. So uh, a lot of people think, oh, we are running everything in the cloud. Uh, the, that, that, uh, that should be not a problem when we want to uh, have a, like a backup or disaster recovery, but always assume the worst. And, and that is the biggest uh, challenge, I think, for, for most people, uh, and especially developers, uh, they always think, uh, well, we will not be attacked or we will not write bugs or we will not be uh, impacted by this or that problem. Uh, but always assume the worst case scenario. And what is really important, and that's the beauty of, of the new uh, framework like Mitri attack. So, for example, when you see that there is a new kind of attack like uh, against uh, log4j okay and you say well we don't use uh, log4j uh, we don't use java we are just uh, using uh, whatever microsoft stack we have but learn from what happened there and and make like this kind of exercise that okay what if it was not log4j but something else that we use would we know about it in time what would be the process to protect against it? Would we be able uh, to patch uh, in time? What if we get this kind of alert on Christmas Eve and everybody is on holiday? How can we cope with this kind of uh, attack? Uh, and so on. For example, the, the Kazea attack that uh, was targeted against organizations in the States by Russians in the weekend on the 4th of July, where it's a very important uh, public holiday there. So a lot of uh, system engineers that I know uh, had to work uh, during that weekend because of this kind of attack. And uh, even uh, I, myself was uh, following up very closely during that weekend because uh, we are a Kazaa customer too. Uh, so it's really important uh, to do that and also exercise recovery. So. What you don't want to happen is that you try to recover after the attack. And then you will know, okay, we have this kind of problem and we didn't know that, or we didn't have the backup of this server that is needed to do the recovery. So you need to exercise this kind of uh, disaster recovery. And keep communicating. Communication is key in every type of crisis management you have. You need to communicate internally you need to communicate with your employees, you need to communicate with your business partners, with the media, um, with the criminals as well, because you never know uh, what kind of data they have stolen. Uh, so it's very important to do that kind of communication. So what can you do to stay secure? And it, this is something that everybody knows if you're in IT security, you know this. The problem is we need to get the organization in place to do that. So stay up to date with the latest operating systems. If you still have Windows 7 or Windows XP, you know that's a problem, right? But sometimes you're uh, limited in budget or it's uh, operational uh, IT that you cannot patch. 
well, then you need to make sure that they are in a separate network segment that they cannot be attacked or that you install an additional security control on top of these devices or next generation anti-malware, whatever you can think about. These kind of things are there. I have been looking at the innovation in the last years in security companies and the technology is there to protect against these kind of attacks. But of course, you need to have the budget. You need to have the management buy-in to be able to do that. You need to have the visibility of the attacks that are ongoing. A lot of people pay a lot of money to have security licenses. But when you ask, uh, did you install the licenses? Did you configure the licenses? Did you update uh, according to the latest attacks? Are you sh testing your security controls that they're able to block the last type of attacks? Sometimes uh, people start to shuffle on their uh, share because um, they don't know or they didn't do that. So it is important that you do these kind of things on every layer that you have because these criminals, they are always looking for the weakest link for that one bug. So you need to have a patching and a maintenance system. And of course, uh, who is patching the patches? Uh, meaning that sometimes if you install a patch, it can break applications. So you need to consider, is this a critical patch? Yes or no? Can it have an impact on my organization when it's being attacked? So you need to have this threat intelligence in place. So a lot of customers are using vulnerability scanning, but you need to combine that with threat intelligence specifically for your organization, for your environment. And if you're not using uh, Log4j, for example, well, you don't need to rush for the patching, but you need to be uh, sure that you have, you, that you don't have that Log4j uh, Java archive somewhere in your environment and that is really impacting you. So it all depends on your asset management. Do you have full visibility and all, everything in your environment? How fast are you able to see that? And that was the test of time that we, that we have with our partners. Right? based on the latest type of attacks, how fast is our technology partner able to react? So for example, when the Log4j vulnerability was announced on Friday the 14th, the day after that on Saturday, our partner Orca Security, with their uh, cloud security posture management, they were able to identify all the accounts that had that Log4j Java archive running in their cloud. So immediately we know, okay, we need to patch this VM or shut down the VM or check why that jar is there and is it being used or not. Very important. So you need to keep an eye on those kind of instant reports that you see. Can it have an impact? Yes or no. And can you learn from that? You have to keep an eye on the vendors because the vendors, because the security vendors and the software vendors, they are the entry point in your organization. And this is a bit the culprit of bug bounty and security research. Bug bounty hunters are looking for vulnerabilities in software applications, in security applications, because when they find a vulnerability, they can earn the bounty. But because they think that the bounty is everywhere, they start to scan every possible uh, attack factor to find a vulnerability and they start to blog about it and then they create a proof of concept and then everybody can start to attack you and you don't even have it a patch. So I think that this year it is very important as well to have like this uh, full disclosure, uh, talking with big bounty communities, how can we protect against these kind of zero day bug reports that are just published on the internet and that are being attacked at the moment that is published. So you need to make sure that you download these patches as soon as possible, that you test the patch as soon as possible, that you know, okay, if, for example, there was a big problem with the, the print nightmare uh, vulnerability on Microsoft, eh? 
the patch was not really protecting against the exploit, so the only solution was to disable the print spool, but then people could not print, and then they're working from home, they need to print, so a full discussion. So very important, try to hook into a kind of community of peers. For example, if you're an insurance company, talk with other security people working in insurance companies. If you are an IT uh, guy, you can, uh, for example, join the tech tribe where uh, security alerts are being communicated as well. And patching means that you need to patch everything, not only your Microsoft stack, but also your security stack, your security control. So uh, if you don't patch, you will not be able to protect against the latest vulnerabilities that are nowadays being published almost on every day. And you need a layer defense, defense in depth, because when one layer fails, it means that you have another security control that is able to detect it, alert it, stop it. And then you need this on every layer. And if you look at this slide, you see a lot of acronyms and, and stuff, but it's very important that you have all these uh, controls in place and have full visibility on what's going on. So, and of course, you need to hack yourself, make sure that you have a full visibility of all your entire attack surface externally, internally, because these criminals, they only need one bug, one vulnerability to attack you. So security awareness is very important, not only for the IT people, but also for your employees as well, because if they receive a phishing mail, that they don't click on that kind of link. So what is important <coughs> today, there are enough online platforms or information on YouTube or OWASP to learn about vulnerabilities, to learn about security. Also the PCB has different curriculums, trainings to help you get the best security skills specifically for your job. And that is the most important Tip, learn to be a hacker, learn every day. Don't think that you know everything, it doesn't exist. Security means that your job is never done, you have to learn every day. But there are so many online tools that help you with capture the flags, with challenges like Hack the Box, they have a big bounty. Uh, training that you can follow and it's very, very good. Peter? Yes, um, as, as Aaron shown in the previous slides, get hands-on experience, J justice theory is not enough and that, that's also very nice to, to know a bit about uh, the, uh, the implementation. One important thing which um, Aaron already touched um, in, in the previous slides is responsible disclosure, which is actually the principle um, or the policy at least to warn uh, people who are testing you or working with you um, to warn them if they see an issue, if they detect something, and even public uh, public audience, or external audience, but also including your partners, your customers, your employees, your contractors, please uh, talk to them, and if possible, set up a contract, set up an agreement at least, that they, they warn you first before publishing anything. Aaron has perfectly explained what happens if you don't. Um, hackers or even bug bounty people uh, are trying to, to find out on some zero days. If they're publishing it up front without you knowing it, you, you're, you're dead, meaning that um, you, your system will be exploited, um, you, you, you're actually uh, into sort of damage control modus, which is after the fact. So um, a responsible disclosure policy is a principle that you actually ask them and anyone who is involved with you to report it first, allowing you to, um, to fix the system first and then communicate about it. And of course, depending on your budget, it might be very uh, useful to set up a bug bounty program or at least uh, uh, reward the people that report these issues to it that save you money um, and so on. So, so it, it, there is a balance that you can find actually to, to reward them even undemanded or if not uh, uh, contracted. Um, giving a award to people is always uh, very interesting. So you can uh, switch to the next screen, uh, Aaron. 
Um, yeah, and, and one of the important things which we already uh, mentioned before, um, there is only one answer to a ransomware and one uh, answer to ransom is backup and a valid restore. Uh, that's the only choice you have to respond to a ransomware if you don't want to pay. In the other case, um, you can have uh, perfect backups, but if you didn't test your restores, if you didn't test them offline, and if you didn't test them to make sure that also your backups are not infected, um, there's not a lot of choice actually once you get hit by a ransomware. So hope and make sure that actually you'll get these uh, restore stuff uh, tested. Also very important, even in these times of cloud, also make sure that you um, have a backup actually in a second generation on a different platform which is not online synced it can be of course another cloud platform but uh, if possible uh, take your backups offline to avoid actually that even the ransomware would hit your backups but you would, would hit your resource and to make sure actually that you're safe uh, just in the case of the worst case uh, scenarios right and last but not least, and uh, then we can actually move over to the Q&A. Um, the next slide is about crisis communication, as, uh, as Evan also mentioned. Is make sure that um, you prepare for the worst, because um, in most of the cases, without preparation, uh, panic will hit. And you will see uh, many companies actually shutting down in communications. Customers can get, start get worrying. Um, in the worst case scenario, um, the news will hit actually um, before you actually can control it. So uh, planning for a crisis communication is a very extremely important measure. And if you're not comfortable with it, uh, talk to a communication uh, uh, bureau or ask a company to help you out on that one because it's extremely important to keep confidence and to explain uh, to your customers, to your employees to your partners actually what is happening um, the most successful companies within the ransomware are not the one actually that are that are kept silent but the, rather the ones that actually are very active and proactive in 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 telling your customers telling the news telling the uh, telling the journalists actually what you're doing what state are you in uh, how are you recovering what is the next step and to do so so that gives confidence actually to your uh, company to your ceo to your customers in, in, in that sense right um this was the um, the last slide actually for our presentations uh, pretty close to the hour so uh, let's open up the floor for some questions uh, okay thank you peter and erwin for delivering this very informative webinar uh, just be informed that pcb offers training and certification courses which will show your dedication in implementing and managing information security and privacy related frameworks and most importantly you will get recognized uh, worldwide just before proceeding to the q and a session we are happy to inform you that the updated pcb iso 2701 and 2702 training courses are uh, uh, coming very soon. Okay, now without further ado, I'll uh, continue with the uh, uh, first question. Uh, can you briefly uh, ex give a view on phishing through website SMS spoofing? Go for it, Aaron. Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Yes, of course. Can you briefly give a view on phishing through website uh, SMS spoofing? Okay, so so what what we see is that the, the these uh, phishing guys they are trying to find a way to be able to reach you without being blocked by mail security solutions like uh, anti phishing uh, whatever you have in place. So they try to send you an SMS or a WhatsApp message or Telegram or LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever because in that way they bypass the anti-phishing solution that your company might have in place. So in Belgium, we have seen a lot of uh, this kind of uh, attacks for um, It's Me, which is a, a service to authenticate you and to log in into the, the, uh, the government or, the, or your bank. So it's very important that when you receive a message, is it from somebody you know? But of course, if they, they hacked uh, your mobile phone or they even can spoof uh, your mobile phone number because I have seen cases that um, they are calling people and with voice over IP, it's also impossible to spoof the, the number. So they, they call you and spoof the number of the, the company and they say, hey, uh, you need to do this for me. So it's really, really, really important to, to stay protected 
and of course to protect against phishing uh, there are solutions like the NS security that don't allow you to, to open this kind of website but of course it, uh, it also requires that your organization have this kind of protections in place so always be aware when you click on a link uh, doesn't it look fishy yes or no um, yeah, and on, on, on top of that one, it, it's quite important. Actually, certainly for SMS matches, probably it's not a smart idea to click on these links anyway. Um, that, that's one thing. And on top of that one, in most of the cases, your national government or the cybersecurity center nationally uh, will have some reporting features to report these phishing emails, uh, phishing SMSs. So it's, it's a very smart idea to, to have a check for your local and national security center and at least as much as possible reporting phishing attempts. Um, and by the way, in most of the cases, you can send them over also to your uh, via your mail client or your operating system. So your vendor, in most of the cases, Microsoft, Apple uh, and application uh, uh, vendors are actually also providing some feedback on phishing. So use that one actually to report as much as possible these phishing attempts. Uh, okay, thank you, Peter and Erwin. The next question is, uh, the Internet of Medical Things is a major problem where the healthcare facility places reliance of the Internet for patient survival. How much is spent on protecting such cyber attacks within the healthcare industry in, for example, USA and UK? Okay, I can answer that one. I'm working for a startup in uh, medical devices. So, um, we see that security is taken very seriously by either the hospitals but also by the, the suppliers of those medical devices to the hospitals uh, they are really ramping up the security uh, but of course there are still legacy environments um, there are still hospitals that don't have budget uh, so it's it's really important to to help uh, those organizations uh, with getting security right, but it, it will take some time. Peter, what you want to say? No, oh, yeah, it's depending on on the sector. Let me put that away. There, there are no exact number on budget, but I think your point is extremely clear. In, in most of the cases, um, the hospitals, at least the medical sector, is is not a commercial one, and not not at least as we know from private companies. So, so it's it's always the question about budgets. Are there any exact numbers? Not really. Uh, meaning that also in many uh, of the, the cyber crime cases, uh, again, th this is a sector that is going silent, so, so we don't see a, a lot of feedback exactly in, in what, what is going on, except for, for supporting what Aaron explained from the technical side. There's, there's a lot of effort to do so, but we're not there yet, so, so you, it, it will be very difficult to get some exact numbers. Right? Um, thank you. The next question is uh, how to train employees to have better phishing awareness. Uh, okay, so well, the best way to do that is uh, send them phishing mails. Uh, so there are uh, platforms like you know before that allow you to do uh, continuous phishing tests with reporting and follow up on those kind of uh, activities. So when somebody opens a mail and clicks on it and opens an attachment, enters his username and password in a in a, this simulated phishing, then uh, you can talk with uh, the employee about his behavior. I know of companies that do this kind of campaigns and the second time that you click on a phishing link, uh, they just uh, shut off your internet connection. Uh, that's the hard way of learning, <laughs> I think. But uh, some companies take this really, really seriously. And the other way is that, of course, you need to be able to training about how to detect phishing mails. So you have, like, uh, you know, before also this online training, you also have the, the, the fish alert button to push when you receive a phishing mail. Uh, talk with your colleagues about uh, phishing that you received and, and all these kind of things. But first of all, I think it's also very important that you try to block these kind of phishing mails at the, the entry point. So invest uh, some budget in phishing protection. Uh, we also see that internal phishing can become a big problem because it's all about trust. When do you have internal phishing, for example? Well, when you're able to hijack somebody's mailbox, 
you can inject mails in mail threads and then people think, hey, this is really for my boss and they click on it or they do whatever they are asked to do. So that's becoming a real problem. Uh, we see that some startups like uh, Mesh Security are allowing uh, to protect against internal phishing because they have full visibility of, of the mails and what a phishing mail looks like. So uh, I think it's on uh, different angles that you need to secure against these kind of attacks. And yeah, very important as we explained um, um, to provide your, your your audience some feedback on trends, what is going on. Provide them with some feedback that explain to them that they are not alone. Um, don't blame them in, in essence if there are, are any incidents, but open up your culture of your company also to have open communications. It's essential not to blame them for mistakes but explain to them that if there is any issue or if they're suspicious about a mail that they, their feeling is mostly right, that they should have reported. So communication and having a report strategy or reporting a feedback strategy is extremely important to support uh, these phishing campaigns and to, to feel them comfortable in reporting any issues and that that's actually the, 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 the way to support this, right? Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, okay, and the last question for today is uh, how do you measure secure by design and default, uh, Article 25? Um, yeah, this is more rather in, um, f first of all, in the development part of that one, and it's also, um, yeah, explained in, in some of the frameworks that you will find, like, for example, the ISO 27000 series, but um, like, like, for example, also, also in OWASP, um, um, there are quite some interesting frameworks that, that will guide you, first of all, into building security in your project. How can you measure that one? is making sure that actually uh, security is on the topic that you implement SDLC, so life cycle development, uh, including discussions on security. Um, how would you, would you measure it in, in the number of, of incidents, in the number of bugs, or the number of features that you have built in your platform? So there are many ways to define uh, specifically for your environment the objective. So there's not one golden rule, but um, there are many ways explained by the different frameworks. And for example, in the development security, HR security in the ISO frameworks, you, you will find some guidelines in, in that sense. For example, in the ISO 27034, you will see uh, some guidelines how developers should cope actually with uh, with design security by design and security by default. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Peter and Erwin, for presenting today, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, just be informed that this session is recorded and will be posted on our website and YouTube channel along with the slides of the presentation. Thank you all. You're welcome. Thank you. See you next time. Thank you. Bye.